welcome to everybody. Uh, this is the um, yes, this is the first uh, tech talk for for this uh, uh, session, session eleven of uh, the School of AI. Uh, I'm uh, Cristiano, uh, the lead AI scientist here, and I'm somehow with the help of uh, all the team from Pi School uh, organizing these uh, tech talks during uh, during our our eight weeks of, uh, of the program. And it's a pleasure uh, today to, to have with us uh, Gabriele and also Alessandro. Gabriele will be the, the, the speaker. And Gabriele, together with Alessandro, they are the co-founder of uh, Argo Vision. In particular, Gabriele is the CTO and Alessandro is the CEO of Argo Vision, which is an Italian uh, startup uh, um, involved in uh, computer vision mainly. And um, I think a couple of years ago, they were, uh, they, they are now part of, uh, of uh, a SEA Vision group. And um, in particular, uh, you can find the, the bio and also the abstract of this uh, uh, talk uh, in the description of, uh, of our event. But about Gabriele, he's got a PhD in applied mathematics and uh, let's say for computational science, uh, he has a strong background in math, computer science, software engineering with a lot of experience. Um, and today he will, um, he will talk about uh, generative models, generative techniques, uh, with, um, in particular with uh, focusing on uh, text to image models that, uh, uh, today, a lot of people are talking about about them, so uh, it will be quite uh, quite interesting uh, to to see um, his point of view, Argo Vision point of view. So feel free, also Ale, if you want to to add uh, at the end of the talk some consideration, it, you're perfectly invited as well to to give uh, your opinion. And obviously, after the the, the talk, we will have a Q and A session. So. For all the fellows and all the people that are here listening, please feel free to, to ask whatever to, to Gabriele. I'm sure he will provide a detailed answer. So I will uh, now leave the floor to Gabriele. Maybe you can share your screen and that's all. Okay, thank you. Well, you are unmuted. I will mute myself. You can unmute. Okay, so hi everybody. So let's talk about um, generative deep neural models. Uh, today uh, there is a lot of rumor uh, related to, to this topic. I wish to, to give you um, uh, an overview from the very basics to, to um, quite a sufficient understanding of what's going on they are in these models uh, all uh, not, not all of them but i think i will speak about recent models and in interesting architectures let's start so uh, the agenda will uh, is very easy let's discuss about what generative models are briefly and uh, let's um see what kind of generative approaches have been uh, proposed, some of them, not all, there are many. Uh, and finally, I will give you um, some information related to the architectures that have been proposed in the last, um, let me say, two years. Okay, so uh, let's start from the very beginning. What discriminative and generative models are? What's, what are the differences? Let's start with a, a toy problem. Uh, let's say we want to uh classify uh, some input data so we have input data x eyes and in our um, data set training data set the ground true gives us also some uh, labels z okay uh, let's say the problem is a simple binary classification problem it's a toy problem uh, we want to um, identify two main ways to uh, solve this, this problem. 
One way is to uh, study this distribution. This is the conditional distribution that given the knowledge about the da data uh, we have in input. Uh, we want to know the distribution, the probabilities of the, um, of the classes. Let me say we have class one and zero. Uh, obviously, if we have these two probabilities, we can choose the class with higher probability. The, um, the graph here is showing two distributions. Let me say this is uh, extracted from a, Ga a Gaussian distribution with some parameters. And these points, the red points with label, with label one, uh, have been drawn from another Gaussian distribution with different um, parameters. Okay, so the discriminative model is giving us uh, uh, a probability. Let me say this is our estimation of the probability to being part of the distribution with class one. Okay, uh, and so what we are doing is to try to discriminate between the classes. So we are solving the problem uh, in a direct way, just trying to discriminate the, the classes, so solving the problem. Let's check what is the, the other approach. The, uh, sorry, this is called maximum uh, posteriori approach because we uh, we are acting uh, posteriori after we have the, the data in our hands. Okay, let's check the, the opposite. What is changed here is exactly the, the uh, this conditional distribution. We're using the, the other way around distribution, the one that given the label, in this case, zero or one, uh, gives us the probability for the data. This is the likelihood that uh, given a particular uh, label, let me say as an example, the label zero, the blue one, uh, uh, moving the free variable X, in this case, it's a free variable. Moving the free variable X, we have uh, a value that is drawn from that distribution. Uh, that's why we call it maximum likelihood. Okay, so let me say that fixing z equals to zero, we get this function. It's a function, it's not a probability. And fixing z equal to one, we get this other function. Uh, given this probability, if we have this probability in our hands, obviously, uh, when we uh, get an input x, we can decide which one, which class is the, the one with higher probability. So. Uh, the classification problem can be solved as before. The difference here is, is that we um, postulated the problem as a generative one because we have the possibility to choose a Z and to draw samples from this distribution generating new samples. This is the, uh, the idea of generative models. Just to give you um, graphical representation of why the, 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 the two names are discriminative and generative. We can see uh, here that the space is uh, partitioned from discriminative models uh, just to assign partitions of the space to uh, distinct labels. Instead, the, um, the generative models try to fit the single um, distributions once the, the label is done, so one per label, okay. This is the very basics about differences between discriminative and generative models. Uh, let's discuss a little bit about how the data uh, are structured, or we, we hope are structured, okay. Uh, the idea is that in the, um, in the space where the data live, let's take as an example the images. We want to process images to, to generate images, so that's a good starting point. Uh, images are made up of pixels. Uh, let's consider grayscale images. The color is mm, a simple generalization. In that case, we have one numeric value for each pixel. So we are covering Rn for m pixels, uh, a very huge space. Uh, the reality is that if you draw randomly a point in Rn, uniformly distributed, in general, you don't get something that is 
um, close to a real image, so to a natural image, okay? Uh, in general, uh, natural images lie on, um, on a manifold uh, that is embedded in this uh, high, very high dimensional space. So the hypothesis is that our images are on a structure and they are not simply uniformly randomly distributed in the, in the, the space where they live. Uh, so one idea is to uh, try to embed images in a lower dimensional space, trying to um, keeping the, the structure. So we want to reduce the space dimensionality to lose some information, but, uh, uh, but to keep the, the structure the pictures has. Uh, as an example, this is the embedding of the handwritten digits of the well-known NIST dataset. And they, as, as can be seen, they form some clusters, one per, uh, one per digit. And the clusters has some um, distances, one each other. Uh, so clusters of digits that are similar are closer than clusters of digits that are uh, more different one each other. And in this simple case, this have been obtained by Tisney. So it's not invertible, it's not uh, really an embedding space, but uh, I think you, you get the idea, okay. Okay, let's speak about uh, the generative approaches. There are really many generative approaches. I wish to um, discuss about mainly two big approaches, two big families. Okay, I uh, mentioned here the explicit approach. I, um, I named the explicit the approach where you decide a priori what's the um, probability distribution model. So uh, the, the likelihood uh, model. In this example, I depicted a um, mix of Gaussians, but in general, the idea is that if you want to model your parametric distribution, uh, in general, it's very, very difficult to get something that can fit real data. So for sure, this is not one approach we will uh, follow. Uh, let's, go, let's see two other approaches. The direct one, the direct approach says, okay, don't model directly the distribution. Model instead uh, the, the map that allows us to move, to, to, to map points taken from the embedding and to, to, to map them into the, the real data distribution. So I can easily uh, draw a point in this distribution because I chose a distribution that can be easily drawn, okay? Uh, and it can be easily sampled. And then I have trained a network in our case that allows me to map it on one point in the, um, the target distribution, the one that is uh, um, represented by my data set. Okay, so uh, I'm generating exactly one image given a uh, randomly sampled, uh, let me say Gaussian vector. Okay, this is what generally happens. In general, this distribution is uh, the, the, the normal one, or the uniform one. Those two are very easy to, to sample from, and generally those have been, uh, have been used in, in the literature. Uh, there is another approach I call the indirect approach. The indirect approach uh, uses uh, two steps. The first step is the training one, where we train one network that can do a whole job of transforming a point of mapping a point into the embedding space, the latent space, let me call it. Okay, and after that, it maps back the point into the, um, the data space. Obviously, if we start from one image and we get back a different image, that's not so useful. So our idea is to map a point in the latent space and go back. So our, our um, loss will uh, keep close the retro map the, the the inverse mapping of the point into the original space so the idea is i can go back go forth and back 
and get the same uh, initial point. So I don't lose information. Uh, after this step, after the training, I can um, forget about the, the embedding part, simply drawing points into the embedding space and using the, the back map to get, uh, in our case, images from the, um, the, data, the data set distribution, the, the distribution I uh, learned from the data set. Okay, uh, is, if something is not clear, uh, let me let me know. We can discuss also in the middle of the presentation, obviously. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so let's see in concrete some of these approaches. Let's start with the last one where we want to um, start from the data set, take a, a picture, map it on an embedding space and map it back to the original distribution. How can this be done? Uh, the, the, the structure, the, the network uh, architecture is called autoencoder. An autoencoder is simply a neural network composed of two parts. The encoder part, uh, in case of images, generally it is, um, a convolutional network, but that's not a constraint, okay? Uh, an encoder that takes the image, transforms it, and gets some tensor here in the middle that we can say it is uh, on the, um, a point on the embedding space, okay? Let me say we start with a tensor with uh, height by height by width by uh, three, okay, here. We use convolutions here and we, can, uh, and we get simply a vector one by n with n that is the um, dimensionality of the embedding space. Don't care about this now. Okay, what we can do is to uh, use uh, transpose convolutions or other techniques to um, get back the spatial dimensions and to reduce again to three, the number of channels. So we can uh, go back to the original, uh, at least shape of our tensor, so in the original space. And after, after that, we can enforce the fact that one picture starting from the original space must be close to the result at the output of the, of the network uh, with a, um, a loss here that enforces this. Uh, something like a uh, mispar error is enough, but there are many, uh, many losses that have been proposed. After the training, I can um, forget the encoder. I can sample from the uh, embedding and generate pictures. What's the issue here? The issue is that I uh, want to be able to sample from the embedding. If I don't constrain the embedding to be distributed uh, as I want, I cannot draw uh, samples from it, okay? So I, I have a tool that allows to me to compress the information in an embedding space, but the embedding, the, the data distribution after uh, being mapped to embedding space are not distributed uh, as I want if I don't add a constraint. Okay, the variational autoencoder are one, not the only one, one of the um, proposed solution to this problem. The idea is to add a new term to the loss. So as you can see here, the loss has two terms, okay? One term, as I said, is useful to uh, constrain the input and the output to be uh, closed. One term in the, in the loss uh, is used to constrain the, the, the embedding distribution. How does it work? In the, in the case of variational encoders, the idea is not to map points in the input space to points in the bending, but to map points in the input space to distributions in the, um, in the bending space. So let me say, if we want to use Gaussian distributions, we can simply uh, uh, produce from the encoder the parameters of our distribution. So one point here becomes uh, a distribution in the embedding space, okay? 
And once we have a distribution in the embedding space, we can sample from it, okay? We can draw samples from this distribution and we can say, okay, these samples in the distribution I obtained must be mapped exactly close to the, um, the output I want. So the, this part is remained. And I want these points to be distributed like a distribution I wish. A proxy distribution, we can call it Q. Generally, it's called Q, OK? This mechanism allows the um, overall distribution of the embedding space to be close to our target distribution. This is one uh, technique used for that. There is a little bit of math behind the, the usage of the, the um, behind the, the variation of the encoder technique. Uh, the name of the quantity we are optimizing is uh, elbow. Elbow is the um, evidence lower bound because in this, uh, this equation, we have the, the log evidence, so the probability of the, 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 the value of the image we have in our hands is the, is the evidence, we have it. The log evidence is an, uh, can be demonstrated to be an upper bound for the, for the elbow. And the elbow is exactly this, this quantity that is made up of two parts, one for the similarity and one for the um, distribution similarity. Okay, this KL is the Kullback labor divergence. Use it to compare to to distributions. Uh, okay, I know the variational encoders are a little bit tricky. Uh, I don't want to focus on, only on this tool, but if you have some questions, we can discuss more about that. Uh, well, open parenthesis. This um, presentation will be available to you, and there are many slides hidden. Uh, because of uh, time issues, I cannot uh, show you all the slides, but you will find them even in the in the presentation. You will be able to check them. There are some explaining uh, some something more about variational routing orders. Okay, uh, let's look at a very very different technique to uh, to generate images. One um, very simple approach, intuitive approach is to say, OK, I, I wish to generate an image. I can simply um, study, learn the prior related to the very first pixel uh, in, in the image. If I have a prior for the per pixel, I can uh, draw a value for it. A pixel is uh, 256 values. So uh, a prior is just 256 numbers summing up to one. So it's very easy to store and to use. Once I generated the first pixel, I can say, OK, I can use the um, conditional probability distribution for the second pixel given the first one. And I can generate the second one and so forth. Uh, in general, I can say I want to know uh, uh, part the, a part of the generated image, the neighborhood of the pixel I want to generate. Okay, and given that, I want the probability distribution that given that can can produce and generate the the pixel I want to generate the new pixel missing in the picture. And so I can scan the the image. I can, I can generate uh, everything every single pixel okay these have been proposed and worked obviously uh, with uh, many uh, issues it's not so so easy it is called our autoregressive model because we are doing regression for every pixel but we are you uh, we are um, constraining every single generated pixel to to the pixels that have been already generated okay uh, one big issue is related to the fact that pixels uh, uh, have a very low granularity and the information associated to pixels uh, is not well structured, not sufficiently structured to generate interesting things. So the idea have been to quantize uh, the, the image, where quantize the image means to break it up in, uh, in chunks that have that are more uh, informative 
uh, as an example, let me say in this part of the image, there is an eye, okay? The, the, something that describes this, this fact is more structured than simply saying that here the re red value is 25, okay? This is the, the idea. Uh, to quantize the, um, the, the, the image, the representation of the image, we need a, a vocabulary, something that contains this information representing the eye, as an example. Uh, and uh, our image will not no more be uh, represented by by pixels, but by keys in in the in the vocabulary. So the information that here I don't know twenty five is the index of the 20, 25 uh, word in the vocabulary saying I okay representing the I. Uh, obviously, we want to be able to uh, to to encode this quantized image, and we want also to be able to decode back the, the image from the quantization version, quantized version, okay? Uh, just as an information, this process can be repeated many times, so we can uh, structure uh, the, the, the image hierarchically at more levels, at many levels, or we can also, like in this case, uh, have structure with different um, granularity and use one level to condition the other level. These are things that have been done. But let's check the, uh, a little bit of details related to how this can work. Um, Please, Cristiano, remember me to give you both the link of this presentation and also link the link to GitHub where I have the code for this oh, so okay. that you can uh, get that Thank and you. check also the code for some of the, for the simple models like this one. Let me say simple. <laughs> uh, there is the code I, I published, so maybe useful to check it. Uh, the idea here is very, very close to the um, autoencoder. So we have the two parts. Let me say this is the encoder and this is this is the decoder. But after the the um, convolutional part that takes the picture and generate our uh, our embedding. So this this tensor here is our embedding. Uh, here we have some special uh, special resolution uh, remain so that we can choose one cell representing one vector for uh, a given position in the in the image okay this is the place where we we want to say i okay we want to define the word i okay at this point what we want to say is okay let's substitute this vector with the word in the vocabulary representing the i so we get a quantized version of the image where this word here, this index, uh, rep represents the index to the word represent, uh, saying uh, I, okay, representing the I. So obviously this vector must be similar to this one because we are introducing an approximation. Given that we can take this image and produce again the, the tensor, uh, picking the vectors from the, the vocabulary, and given that, we can train the decoder as before. So we can have a convolutional neural network that, as before, can decode the embedding, the embedded image to get back the, the original image or something close to the original image. OK, what are the constraints we want to use in our loss here? Uh, as usual, we want this to be close to this. OK, so we want um something that compares that compares the um, the decoded image with the original image but we want also these vectors here to be close to vocabulary vectors because we want to reduce as much as possible the approximations introduced by quantization okay so uh fix the vocabulary we want to have these close to the to one of the um, vectors in the vocabulary. And this can uh, be called a good encoder. We want a good encoder. Uh, this equation represents the mean square error 
where we are using the encoder and we are propagating the, the gradient in the encoder and we are using the stop gradient um, operator to say okay i don't want to uh, propagate the gradients to the um, to the vocabulary okay and we want also to train a vocabulary because we don't have it we don't have a vocabulary where this represents the i as an example so we want to uh, train the vocabulary so that so that it is useful for uh, for the embedding part okay so we have also a good code book or a good vocabulary as you can uh, say um, that is another term in the in the loss saying exactly the opposite that is uh, we want the mean square error between uh, vocabulary and embeddings to be small but we want to propagate the, the gradients in the direction of the vocabulary and not in the direction of the, uh, of the encoder, okay? So we are mm, training at the same time, one encoder, one decoder, and one vocabulary in this network, okay? That's the idea. Uh, okay. Uh, Let's change again the kind of generator. Finally, we will see that all these generators, uh, all these tools have been used in recent tools, in recent um, networks. That's why we are looking at them. Uh, this generator, from a certain point of view, is the simpler one, because this is one direct case in the in one of the slides, I said there are direct and, in, and indirect approaches. The approaches we saw uh, up to now were all indirect approaches with an encoder and a decoder. This is a direct approach. Uh, that's conceptually very simple. I sample from a Gaussian, input the Gaussian to the network, the network generates the image. That's it. Okay. This is what we train. What is the idea of having a discriminator and uh, this minimax problem the idea is that we are um, we are smart in the loss so we have a, a loss a fancy loss as i said here a fancy loss that allows to me to um, force the output distribution of my generator to be close to the distribution of the data and this loss is a discriminator, a classifier that, that must classify if the picture it gets are uh, real pictures from the data set or generated pictures. Okay, so the loss, to, uh, the loss is constraining me, is constraining the generator to generate pictures that are in the same distribution of my data set because the discriminator penalizes uh, the the other the other way around the, the other case okay so in a certain from a certain point of view you can see uh, generative other adversarial networks as simply direct methods with a generator and a fancy loss a smart loss that allows this generator to be to be trained okay um, why we have a minimax problem here because when we start we want to generate we generate images that are uh, garbage completely far from the real data distribution and the the discriminator cannot distinguish from real and fake images because ha has not been trained uh, so the idea is okay i can generate pictures and i can train the my my, my discriminator so my loss i can train my loss so that it can distinguish between real and fake images. Once I have a discriminator that can distinguish the uh, fake and real images for one certain status of the generator, then it can work really. It, it can propagate gradients and it can update the generator. Once the generator is smart enough to fool the discriminator, uh, it's time to get an updated discriminator that works better than before. So again, we can train the discriminator with generated pictures and so on. This is uh, the, the minimax problem. The, um, the discriminator wants to fool the generator, so wants 
this value to be uh, maximized. Instead, the, the, um, the generator wants to fool the discriminator, maximizing, minimizing this one. Okay. Uh, again, you have an example in the code I will share with you in, in GitHub. Gabriele? Yes. You in the chat, I see a question from Menon to you on okay. the previous Let on the previous slide presentation of the embarrassing old encoders. Yes. Uh, where is the chat? Here. Bottom left. Got it? Yes, I got it. Okay. Uh, so the question is one question. Uh, understand that the input and output are nearly same, but since it's learning the distribution of embedding space of input, why can't we use variational auto encoders for classification task? Since the embedding sample from the distribution will belong close to region of the distribution which belongs to that class. Okay. Uh, um, in theory, yes, you can use that also for classification, but we are not facing the classification in this moment. Let me go back to variational auto encoders. Okay. Uh, here, our task is to um, obtain a tool that allows me to draw samples from, from, the, from a distribution that is easy to be sampled and then to map these points to uh, our data distribution to generate new new data okay so the task is not uh, the classification one but yes you can uh, use uh, variational encoders for cl for classification in many many ways uh, one way is to say okay after training i have uh, clustered data here okay so if i have two classes maybe they have been clustered in a well-defined uh, structure, and I can map them here and use something to classify them directly here. This is one possibility. Uh, there are also other uh, more interesting possibilities. That is, I can train a distribution for one class, and I can try to map points from the input to that uh, output uh, distribution and if the point is belongs to the same class generally i back uh, i get back a good reconstruction if points are not belonging to that class but belongs to a class i have never seen uh, in the training set i get a very high uh, reconstruction error and that's discriminate binarily between known and unknown uh, samples so yes it can be used also for classification i hope uh, this answers your your question yes it does thank you okay uh, okay so uh we are done with generative adversarial networks obviously there is a lot of literature here and uh, i'm sorry but this is just uh, a bird eye view over these techniques because we want to put them together because they have been used in recent works so uh, let's put together the generative adversarial networks with vector quantized by okay so uh, we have uh, what have been called the vector quantized gun it's simply see, not not really simply but okay from this point of view it's simply um vector quantized by where we have uh, an encoder that produces our uh, our tensor and then the, the encoding with the, a, a code book as before uh, and a decoder that allows us to reconstruct uh, the, the image the, this image okay. what are the differences the differences are in the um, in the loss two main differences one of these is that a discriminator is added to the loss so the the, the fancy loss um, we found in the generative adversarial network is used here to get realistic images 
In this case, instead of uh, discriminating between uh, real and fake images, the same discrimination uh, have been done patch-wise. So every single patch is uh, discriminated as real or fake. Okay, and the idea is that uh, despite very short encoders, generative adversarial networks produce uh, sharp images. Instead, very short encoders produce blurry images. That's why this uh, this tool, this step, uh, this additional part of the loss is, is useful here, okay? So the output images are more realistic this way. Uh, the other difference is that the, um, the loss used um, for this part and also for this part, okay? The, the comparison between the input and the output and the, um, the comparison between tensors uh, are are um, are different. In particular, uh, something called a perceptual loss is used. What is a perceptual loss? A perceptual loss is something that doesn't compare uh, pixels, but compares representations of the image produced by other neural network. Uh, let me say as an example: if you use uh, a neural network for trained for classification like uh, Inception, okay you can truncate it at the end, uh, remove the, the softmax, and uh, get the embeddings pre produced by the inceptor, inception network. Instead of comparing the pixels, you can take your images, the input and the output, get those embeddings, and compare directly those, those embeddings. This, in general, produces better results. That's why it has been invented and used here. OK. Uh, in the, this diagram you see also a transformer it's not important now but the idea here was to um to to train a transformer to to train the code book and also to to generate words in the code book so that it is possible to generate uh, quantized images decode them and get the, the 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 generated images back okay this is the the idea, but the important part is the fact that here we are, we are adding the generative adversarial network part of the loss. Okay, I don't know if there are, are no, okay. So uh, just because they are so, um, so deeply used today, let's take a look to the noise in diffusion probabilistic models just the overall idea. The overall idea is uh, uh, simple and uh, curious, let me say. The idea is, okay, we how can we map points from the data distribution to a Gaussian distribution? Uh, we tried without encoders saying, okay, I can map them in a direction and the opposite direction and force some constraints in the loss for the for the distribution of the embedding. In this case, we are saying, yeah, uh, okay, it's it's easy. We can use Brownian, Brownian motion. With Brownian motion, let me show you. Uh, let me show you if I can. Okay, this is an example of Brownian motion. We have distribution that is the the moon's distribution. After adding noise, we get something. After a lot of noise, we get something similar to the to the Gaussian distribution. Okay. If we if we add Gaussian noise, we get something that is more close to Gaussian noise than uh, the original distribution. And the the interesting thing is that we can go back. We can start from noise and go back to the original distribution. This is the uh, curious part. The strange part, let me say. Okay, in this picture here, you see uh, one input picture uh, and a schedule of noise to go in the direction of Gaussian noise. Uh, these two are two different schedules, so uh, we must decide how much noise will be added at every step. Uh, so let's see what we do. Uh, the forward diffusion is easy, we simply add. Uh, some noise, so our distribution, the, our conditional probability, this, let's say, okay, I have some 
some an image in input and i want to sample uh, an output image is something easy we have the original Im image as the, the mean of our distribution and we have some noise around that mean okay uh, the difficult part is the uh, is the denoising part. The denoising part is made up of um, neural networks. So neural networks are trained to do every single denoising step. Uh, consider that uh, the idea is to have uh, many many steps. So we move from the noise image to the uh, to the target image in small steps, many small steps. Okay. Uh, related to this technique, there is something called, called the uh, score-based generative model. In a score-based generative model, what we want to do is to say, okay, I'm in the decoding part, in the denoising part, okay? The denoising part, I have a noisy image, I want something that is less noisy, so I want to move in the direction of the... Um, of the maximum probability around that that sample okay i want to move in the direction of the mode closer to me how can i do that a simple way to do this is a uh, hill climbing that is i want to have the gradient of my uh, log evidence and i want to move in the direction of this gradient to reach the maximum log evidence for the, the image I have, the noisy image I have. This is the, the overall idea. So the, the idea is that I need this gradient, I don't have it, and I approximate this gradient with uh, a neural network again, okay? Uh, and I want to, uh, to do this iteratively for different noise schedules uh, so that after, uh, after the, the wall, the noise in pro process, I get the image I want. Okay. Uh, today, this is uh, something that is used in uh, almost all the uh, text to image models, and is based on the uh, on the idea of the of the of the diffusion, the noise in diffusion probabilistic models. Okay. Uh, there are many variations on this topic but i think it's time to um, to think about the applications of all these uh, some uh, obvious applications are sampling distributions and i saw uh, really many many uh, kind of images uh, being sampled from this kind of models so, I don't know, a generator of pizzas, a generator of faces, generator of manga, and many, many strange things. Another thing we can do is to project an, a real image on the, uh, on the um, distribution represented by a, a model. So, I have a model that cannot represent everything. Let's say, in this case, a model representing faces, and I can try to uh, get the most similar face I can generate with that model with respect to the, a given input image. Uh, this example is the one I uh, expressed before on the um, binary classification of um, uh, of a data uh, of a point by means of a, an autoencoder. So in this case, I I have an autoencoder trained on uh, um, healthy old brains and if i give to this autoencoder a brain that is not healthy that is a hill the reconstruction will be healthy and the difference will give me uh, some some informations okay but the kind another kind of a, a very interesting and useful application is super resolution so instead of using uh, classical tools like interpolation uh, we can have a very effective super resolution generating in one sense the, the images with the higher resolution uh, in a sense we are inventing the content of the image uh, moving so uh, for, from one resolution to another okay we are introducing details that are not not there at all uh, why we are speaking about this because our real 
topic we want to speak about is text to image is text to image uh, generation okay uh, and those tools have been used in this in this field um, what what is the idea the idea is to have the possibility to uh, describe the content of one image with the text and to draw from the distribution with the condition so with the conditioning label related to the text okay so it's a, a, the, the sampling from a conditional distribution where the condition is the text uh, this picture as an example have been generated saying okay the conditioning is text but also parts per existing part of the picture so we can condition of ma on many different kind of uh, information and iteratively this have been expanded adding information on the on the two sides obviously someone said okay i want to add this kind of uh, character here uh, and it must be attached well with the image already exists and th this was the conditioning it, it it's a long work it's not direct but as you can see uh, it is possible to get really fancy things or really funny things <laughs> okay um a little bit of uh history um in uh, uh, 2022 we saw uh, dali from open eye that was an outdoor aggressive model uh, as you can see all these models are really oops are really huge sorry i i clicked the link uh, okay that was the, the the source of this picture um um and as you can see all these models are are really really huge okay uh, at this um december of the same year um open and i produced the, a, a different model with a very big step from the previous one and introduced the usage of diffusion uh, into this kind of models okay and diffusion models have been used uh, again to produce DALI2 so DALI2 is uh, mainly a diffusion model uh, I, I'm saying this but that's not completely true because these models are complex they contain many parts and some parts of them uh, are diffusive but some parts are not some parts are progressive so they are they are complex uh, uh, there is a, uh, a link here where you can see that there is a lot of effort uh, a lot of um, works these are all 2022 works all just related to this topic so there is a lot of uh, literature recent literature speaking about this kind of uh, of generators okay uh, okay let's check how these tools work uh, let's start speaking about dolly um, at the ba very base dolly works with the uh, click what is click the idea here is to uh, get a tool a network that allows us to classify uh, images uh, on in, in a zero shot way what does that mean that means that if uh, we get a new data set we never saw with new labels we never saw so the labels are not fixed we want to be able to classify in the new problem with new labels the the, the images anyway okay how can we do that the idea is that we want to uh, associate somehow text to images so that we can produce uh, captions for the new classes the data set gives us the unseen data set gives us and then we want to process the, the the images and the texts to match captions with images this is the the idea behind zero shot uh, classification with clip 
the, this, this part is not interesting for us in this moment. The interesting part is how uh, these two components are trained. The idea is that we have um, some, some images associated to their captions. Okay, this is the training set. We already have the associations in the training set. And we want to train a text encoder that gives us some uh, vectors. So every single caption is converted, is uh, encoded in a vector. Uh, and we want to get input images. And again, every input images becomes a, a vector. Okay, And we want to compare this vector these two vectors using uh, the cosine distance. So we simply uh, multiply them with the dot product, and we want images and associated captions to have high values in the dot product. So uh, we want them to be um, uh, close in the cosine distance, and we want um texts and unassociated images images that are not related to those uh captions far in the cosine distance with low dot product values okay uh, almost orthogonal that's the idea so enforcing uh, with a contrastive pre-training enforcing with this uh, these constraints we can train the parameters of um, encoder and decoder, and we can get these two uh, fundamental tools used for for Dolly, used also in Dolly. Okay, I I hope you get the the idea. There is another question. Yes, uh, Gabriele, just just to tell you that um, there there was a question, and then uh, at most in uh, three four minutes we need to um, to finish. Because some of the um, the guys uh, of the fellow have uh, have another call. Ah, okay. You let see? me let me answer. Don't worry. Uh, okay. okay. Let me answer the question after after the end. So three four minutes, and then I will also answer the question. So um, okay, we understood clip. How let me keep the transformers. How is it used? The idea is to use uh, um, the clip objective to to train, uh, to train uh, text encoder and image encoder. And the idea is that we are uh, training something that associates text to images. So given a text, we are given a new text, we are able to uh, produce the uh, text encoding. And we need just to convert, to transform the text encoding in the associated image encoding to uh, to produce an image. So once we have an image encoding, we are able to uh, to decode it and produce the image. This is the idea uh, under clip. Uh, there are many uh, details. I reported some of them, but I want to show you some more information. So I prefer to skip uh not so interesting that's not true interesting parts but i want to show something more um another model that uh, was uh published just after few few days after uh dolly 2 is imagen imagen uh, works in a different way it pre-trained the text model and after the pre-training of a text model only on text. So here the idea is I want a good uh, text model that can represent information from text to an embedding. Given that, frozen this, I can train, uh, in this case, a unit that can convert text to images. I can do that just for small images for uh, complexity constraints. And so I have small images that must be um, upsampled with the super resolution networks. And uh, here they used two step super resolution. And these super resolution next networks can be uh, conditioned on information contained in the text embedding so that this information is provided also to them during the um, 
that, that supports social process. Okay. Another similar, uh, quite similar uh, technique, similar to, 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 to Dolly, is to train, pre-train uh, an autoencoder that can uh, represent um, images in an image embedding space with quantization. Uh, here, the, the VQ GAN have been used, so we have something that has been quantized here. And we can train also the, the decoding part together. So we are training uh, a VQ GAN here. So we can quantize and dequantize. After that, we will not use this connection, but we want to take the quantized uh, information to uh, train a transformer that can transform, can convert um, text embeddings to image embeddings, okay? So the idea is to have three components. These can be trained by, uh, from, from scratch. These can be trained just on a corpus and produces a text embedding. And after those have been trained, we can train uh, a decoder that converts text embedding to, to image embedding. And after that, with the image embedding, the quantized image embedding, we can, uh, we can dec decode it two images, okay. Uh, one minute, I have, have I got hey, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, okay. Yeah. Uh, so just this slide, you will see uh, the other slides yourself. Uh, the stable diffusion uh, model, we saw this, this two, uh, this last month, uh, is very close to the previous ones, but it's cheaper. And the idea was to say, okay, I want to use diffusion. So I, I need to use diffusion to, uh, to learn how to generate from the embedding space the, the, the images. Instead of working in the image space that is, uh, is expensive, I want to work in a space that is smaller, so cheaper. So the idea is to train um, an encoder and a decoder in an autoencoder fashion, okay, uh, that allows me to, to um, map points from image space to, to, to the um, latent space. And then I want just to work in the latent space with the diffusion. The diffusion in this case is done using uh, units that are um, time independent. So every uh, the, the unit can be used for different times, giving the, the time as a parameter. And the unit is uh, something similar to um, an autoencoder with the, with the skip, skip connections. And it has been um, conditioned with the externally produced values that can be produced from text, but also from other kind of inputs. And this conditioning have been done, uh, have been obtained using these cross attention uh, layers that are exactly attention layers that receive uh, keys and values from, from the, the conditioning part and receives queries from the previous block. So the, the blocks are connected one each other with the, the, the queries, interpreted quiz, as queries and the keys and values are produced from this tau uh, function. Uh, okay, so I think the 30 seconds as are yeah. finished. You will find here some, some details. I, I don't have time to discuss them. Maybe there are some questions instead, I don't no. know. Th thank you. I, I think that I will maybe collect uh, all the questions because uh, we, we have, um, the fellow have another call now. With, yes. Uh, and there, there is, uh, um, so th they are waiting on, on the other call. So maybe I will, uh, will collect some question and maybe send it. Uh, just my feedback really uh, was super interesting, this presentation, very detailed with a lot of link. So I'm very happy about, about it. I'm, and I'm quite sure that also all the fellows are, are really happy. Um, so I will collect all the, um, the question somehow send, uh, send them uh, to you and uh, Alessandro and uh, remind to send me the presentation and if you have the GitHub repository. Yes. And maybe we'll invite you another another time just to, to answer <laughs> all the questions. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you to everybody. And uh, 
Thank you, Gabriele. Thank you all. Have a good day. Bye, guys. Thank you very much. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you on the other call. Bye.